my friends and welcome to the one within all i'm chance and you're listening to interverse this episode features ethan nichols a comic style graphic artist of superb skill who weaves spiritual stories inspired by psychedelia and the infinity of the supreme self into some awesome comic style work he's a new friend of mine and in this podcast we're going to talk about ethan's comic inner demons a beautiful 24 pages of slick and stylish panel by panel action that tells the story of a teenage girl who lucid dreams her way from an oppressive Catholic school to some kind of total self-realization. We'll also surely discuss ideas about dreams, consciousness, and just what this universe might be, so be sure to put on your metaphysical thinking cap before you sit that ass down and burn that grass up for this chat with a very introspective and trippy artist named Ethan Nichols. I do hope you take a few moments to check the show notes for this episode and take a look at Ethan's Instagram page, which is Art of Ethan where you can see pages from the comic I just mentioned, a link to the music I selected for the show by Beatcraft, a super awesome psychedelic electronic music duo from Switzerland. Thanks, guys. And best of all, in the show notes, you'll find links to Patreon for Ethan and me, which is Interverse. By subscribing to this show on Patreon, you can get access to the full two hours of this combo and a pretty big archive of previous plus episodes, too. Of course, I am totally thrilled to have you here for the free show. So thank you all for listening. And remember, I love you. But if you get into this conversation and decide you want the whole shebang, just check the show notes for a link to patreon.com forward slash interverse. Sign up and I'll be sure to thank you on the show. Your support's the only kind that we've got. Or I say we. It's actually me. Just me (laughs) doing it all. So I don't do any ads, you know. I'm not trying to put advertisements in front of you. You get enough of that. So if you do want to support what I'm doing here and help me keep doing it, please subscribe. And speaking of which, I wanted to give all my heartfelt gratitude and big thank yous to all the patrons who are with us and a shout out to Karen Lee for the amazingly generous continued monthly donation. With that, I think it's time we all let go of what we're working on or thinking about or even worrying over and let all those layers of the external world identity fall away one at a time so we can meet our new friend Ethan Nichols in the plane of eternal oneness and give him non-duality hugs and high fives. (laughs) Not sure how that would actually work, but you guys are smart. I think you can figure it out. Welcome to the show, Ethan. Thanks for having me, man. It's an honor to be on. This is probably my first podcast, actually. I don't think I've ever sat down and done something like this. I like to be a lot of people's first. (laughs) Yeah, it should be cool. I think we got a lot to talk about. I think uh, just checking out your page and stuff, there's a lot of uh, like minds, I'm sure, have already said similar things. Yeah, absolutely. We're in good company here, especially with some of the themes that are in your storytelling. So I guess I'll let you take the take the initiative here and decide whether you'd rather talk about your own backstory or talk about some of the thematic elements in your creative work. I I won't go there until you do because I don't want to necessarily spoil things for a story that is well worth reading in its correct order. But uh, yeah, man, would you like to go with? Um, Well, we could start off just saying the basic premise. I think you already said of inner demons, what you just read. It's basically, uh, it's not exactly the same as my story. It just has uh, parts from my life in it. I just started out with the idea of just some girl uh, lucid dreaming, which is something I did in the past. Uh, I started like age seven. I started lucid dreaming uh, around there. I mean, I've been dreaming since I can remember in my childhood, but um, the story is basically her lucid dreaming and she's followed by this little angel and uh it's pretty much just an adventure of her inside of her mind and battling like depression. And also if she goes to a Catholic school and, and 
that's part of my life. I was raised as a Catholic, like until I was like in fifth grade, I went through all the different, um, I don't know, sacraments. And so that sort of had an impact on my, uh, the beginning of my, I guess, view on the universe and myself. So yeah, that's pretty much what Inner Demons is about. I think that that's really well expressed, just how much pressure is put on children in environments like that uh, of (laughs) just basically like guilt and fear all to create a necessity in the person's mind that they must conform, otherwise they're damned. And I feel like that's the bane of creativity and freedom. And essentially, you know, it's kind of the opposite of spirituality, you could say. And and, uh, I wouldn't think we would offend a lot of listeners by saying something like that about religion. But, you know, Mm -hmm. what does offend is kind of a good sign of what you should work on, right? Yeah, I would say so. If you feel uh, too attached to a certain identity within a religion or a certain way of thinking even atheism is limiting your own point of view honestly um there's nothing wrong with it it's just i think yeah if you have such strong beliefs about certain things maybe you should check that out and that's what i got from a lot of the people in this church environment growing up was like if you didn't believe it you're kind of a weirdo and i even remember thinking about one of my neighbors, I heard from my mom at the time that she didn't believe in God. And I thought that was so weird. I was like, what? That's so weird. I remember she would always wear like tie dye shirts and had like dreads and stuff. But now as a 25 year old, I completely see where she was coming from. But before it was like a completely different idea of God. I liken it to Santa Claus actually for kids. Actually, I think the whole Santa Claus mythology is a way of like warming kids up to the idea that there's a magical being out there that knows if you're good or bad and rewards or punishes you accordingly. And in a way there is, but it's not a magical being out there. It's a magical aspect of yourself that immediately mirrors and reflects back to you what you put out into the world. And so the fact that there is that kind of like karmic boomerang that is obvious for everybody to that's paying even a little bit of attention. It makes it, I guess, possible for people later in life to stay stuck in a dogmatic view of what's out there. But I think uh, the biggest harm that is being done is separating people from a, their right to choose for themselves what they want to think and b from the realization of their own, personal power and responsibility in what, you know, what it is that life serves up to them, not uh, blaming it on some, you know, magical entity or, or whatever it's, you know, it's what we think, act and say. Yeah. And I would also say that the, the whole journey of being in that environment and that mindset growing up was part of my own journey into like breaking free from that sort of, uh, way of life I mean it's definitely a part of the same game and I, would, I think I'm, I wouldn't regret I wouldn't take back that experience of just believing in something that wasn't true just because I was told to believe that yeah looking back on it I would definitely not take that part out of my life it's definitely still helped and not all parts of it were bad I mean it was still about peace and love and stuff. There was just a lot of misunderstanding. Yeah. It's not like we need to tear down all the tenets or aspects of various religions around the world. I think it's just better to, and a lot of even Christians uh, will have this type of understanding that it's about your inner connection to the divine. You could say Uh, the it's more, important to be a good person than to be right about what you think the world is, I think. (laughs) So that's important. Yeah. And I'm not even sure what that was. Honestly, it was just, I guess, to trying to get to heaven. So it's almost like you could still be kind of an asshole here on earth. 
for a little bit and then you'd have to just make up for it by going to confessions or something and you'll still go to heaven later on. But, uh, since then it's definitely been, yeah, like what you said, it's not somewhere else. It's like yourself. It's not like at the end of your life, it's right now, basically, which isn't what they were teaching me at all. Really. They weren't, um, showing me, it directly, which is what I felt was a big hole in my heart um, growing up. And so deciding that I wasn't going to believe in God anymore, it sort of left this sad feeling. I mean, I got really depressed, which is another part of this comic I just finished writing. The character like me got really depressed and basically um, that was sort of a entering point where like a catalyst or suffering basically is like a really big push to sort of figure out your life. Yeah. That's actually one of the problems that we've got right now in society is that this medicated uh, prescription pill popping uh, culture of, I don't want to feel my actual feelings all forms of anxiety are bad. Push it away. Push it away. Actually, there's this is something that was spoken about by Freud uh, too, and I think Carl Jung. But it's really important to actually have legitimate human suffering and misery. It's part of the growth experience. It's a catalyst. Helps you know what should be changed or what to be looking for. And it's like a tempering. You know, athletes will say pain is weakness leaving the body, but you know, that's part of it too, is that this is actually our bodies that are getting repressed by some of these forms of spirituality. Like you're saying, I'll just be, some people might have that. It's common notion that I can just go confess and then my sins are absolved and it doesn't matter what shitty things I do because this is earth and heaven is somehow separate. And that ends up playing out in like body to body violence or body just like you know bad feeling to bad feeling passing it on and not caring about the consequences of that and the old like the body is evil or the material world is to be looked down on because heaven is what's important i think all of that is what separates us from the what alistair crowley called the holy guardian angel which you have as a character in inner demons gabby the main character has a little sidekick angel that's or my is the main character and gabby's the sidekick i'm sorry <laughs> and anyway like to just round off my point about this i think the disconnect that we suffer for, from our actual bodies is also the same wall that causes that disconnect from the the holy guardian angel inner voice higher self all of that because i think that thing isn't even some distant other dimensional soul thing i think it's like in our bodies and our health is a big barricade to it yeah i don't think uh there's really any separation at all i think um speaking about that is kind of assuming that we're something other than it and that we're listening to some voice but it's usually because we're identifying as something in our minds that creates ourself as an object and then we assume that that other thing is somehow another object or something or it's just too abstract to even imagine and so it just seems like it's not here but from my own experience it's more it seems like the only separation is just a belief in a thought and uh, like my whole uh questioning like what I am and everything started with lucid dreaming just because, you know, when you go to sleep at night, you're suddenly in a world that's like, like super extremely vivid. It's like as real as reality, if not even more real, it seems. And you wake up and you wonder like, how did all that just exist in my head? So it makes you wonder, like, what are you in the dream and what are you uh, in reality? And so, yeah, then what is the thing 
at the source of both of those different things, it must be uh, the same as that um, holy ghost or whatever you said. Yeah, it's the spark of source consciousness. Like, what is that? What is the divine spark? All these terms that get bandied around. I think if you really strip it down, and this is something that you express in some of your comics I thought was so cool. You strip everything away till there's nothing but a blank slate of zero identity. You know, my name, where I live, my history, who I care about, what I'm afraid of, what I love. Everything completely just turn it off for a minute. And what's left is a feeling of I am. And actually in the Bible, that's what the Yahweh entity often uh, it says about itself when asked who it is. He says, I am. So, you know, that's, that's a very interesting yeah. little piece that's coded in to that old mythology. And it's a clue that, you know, what is the source of all things? It is basically like the decision to be is at the, the root cause of all. Yeah. And even somebody, I think I've just heard this on, I've never read the Bible, but I guess somebody asked Jesus, show me the way or something. And he said, I am the way. So somebody who doesn't understand that might even mistake that as some egotistical thing or like, Oh, me as a person, I'm the way, you know, but that's, that's definitely how it's been interpreted <laughs> by the you know main yeah. religion. Yeah. Like atheists will take things very literally and that's not what it means, obviously. But I guess, yeah, that was part of my own thing is I never wanted to like look at, like I remember just when I first started feeling these things for the first time, I would look at a picture of Jesus Christ and I would still feel that like childhood strangeness. Like, how can I worship this guy? Like what? It just felt strange. And, but I knew that it was like a part of just my ego that this little identity that I was still um, giving attention to and giving reality that was making me feel uncomfortable about some dude who existed on this planet like 2000 years ago. Yeah. But I think it is also a natural and a correct thing to have an aversion to something or somebody setting itself up as an authority because you really can't have authority invested in a person. So there can't, like you're saying, it's a misinterpretation to look at the Christ character as this is the only way that, you know, this is the, somehow this is the key to your salvation because messiahs and saviors are not the keys to our salvation. They are the perpetuation of the master slave dynamic that humanity has been trapped in, which is bad for the masters and the slaves. So you, we really don't, want to keep playing that game so that we've really got to figure out a different way to allegorize the actual truth, which is that, yeah, someone can say I am the way, but they also have to recognize everybody else is also the way <laughs> they have it inside of them. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that when, and if Jesus actually said that, that is probably what he was saying to the person too, like you are too. And like, there's no difference, but I mean, Jesus Christ is still gaining new followers that do feel and understand that he's not like necessarily like only me. He's just sort of an example, I guess, of that blank slate uh, in my comics where everything's stripped away. And that's what he is, I guess, I guess the reflection of ourself. But I don't know about, uh, I think these characters or whoever stands or symbolizes this uh, blank slate of a human, I guess, just uh, the pure being or whatever, they'll still, they'll still keep on popping up. I think even Buddha and Jesus and all of them aren't probably going to uh, disappear in our history for a while, I think. It's just going to keep going. But yeah, of course, people corrupt it and they don't understand it, but it kind of ruins it for everyone else. The fact that followers can turn something into an excuse to take things that aren't theirs from other people or hurt other people does completely 
defeat the original point and purpose of any message. And then you, you said, yeah, I haven't read the Bible. Well, the Bible itself is pretty unintelligible unless you get go through it with uh, the original language and etymology dictionary because the meanings of things have changed so dramatically. If, you, if you're looking at it in the first languages, they're talking about things like rocket ships and spacemen. And then we get down to like the modern versions of the Bible and it's all been supernaturalized to be uh, these, you know, angelic beings and, and such. But if you look at the original words in, in Greek of the old Testament, and that's not quite the original, even I guess the original original is like the Hebrew, I'm sorry, new Testament's one written in Greek, but God, the God Yahweh character literally walks in a body around in the garden and somehow we've supernaturalized all of this and said that this is like some magical disincarnate entity later down the line that they're calling God. But it's so weird. There's like multiple versions of the character. Um, we might be getting off in the weeds though. And I, I'd like to talk more about lucid dreams maybe and see what, see what some yeah. of the techniques that you use for that might be and how you, how you practice that or where you learn some of it. Well, I think when I first had my first lucid dream. I'm not even sure if this is the first one because I mean, it's dreams, you know, sometimes you just don't remember them and they're so vague really. But I think I was about seven or so. I would just say around then. And I just remember sort of becoming aware that it was a dream and I saw somebody and I ran right at them and I jumped and like hugged them. That's the first thing I did in a lucid dream. Because I guess I knew that you, it would be more strange, I guess, if you did that in real life. Uh, but it's just funny, that's the first thing I thought of was to go hug some person in my dream. But yeah, I think from then, I think more in like middle school, I started having more lucid dreams. And I, I realized that you could get better at them. And I started reading this book called Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming by Stephen LaBerge. I think that's how you say his name. But it's just like a how-to lucid dream book. And I started writing all my dreams down every day. Uh, I have like two full dream journals uh, almost. And um, just writing them down every day, You, I think most people who are interested in this stuff uh, – know that the more you write it down, the more you remember. And you can also do the reality checks. But I would have dreams like I would become lucid and I'd be in like a bar. And one time I went, I went to the bathroom and looked in the mirror. And the night before I did this, I planned this out. And I, now I was actually doing it in my lucid dream. I looked in the mirror and I saw my face and I try to remember waking reality like you would try to remember a dream when you woke up. And I couldn't remember anything about my waking reality. It was just the same, but just like flipped. And, but looking at myself in the mirror, it was all so super duper real. And I think just lucid dreaming sparked a curiosity into like the nature of reality for me. Because it's definitely, um, I don't know, it's such a profound experience, as you probably know. Yeah, I'm definitely not as accomplished as, I say accomplished, but dedicated is a better word. You know, I have kind of let my dreams go by the wayside. There's actually a point made in the comic about cannabis use before bed and messing up your dreams. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's been my my situation for good couple years and uh but i've totally been inspired after reading your stuff to be more diligent about laying off earlier in the day and to my great pleasure i have had good dreams the last couple of nights but not writing them down of course it all totally fades away uh -huh. but i love what you're saying about how hyper real the, the lucid dream can be because when i have had a waking up in my dream experience it does feel like the realest possible thing. And I've had every, I've had everything happen from immediately flying away, which is the most common thing that I do to waking up in the dream and 
going, oh, I, I'm awake now. All this is going to dissipate. I'm going to go back to start to like the start menu and having everything just go completely white out and sort of look like the loading screen in the matrix. So I've had some weird lucid dreams myself without have, and also some very interesting ones, of course, that weren't lucid in the sense that I was controlling them, but were lucid in the sense that they're extremely vivid and I remember them afterwards. So I guess what I like to look at this as is the fractality of the cosmos at play with our dreams. Because if you look at, you know, a solar system, it can resemble cellular structure or molecular structure. And there's all these different scales of things, octaves, you could say, where you're having the same pattern repeat on a different scale of size. And so it makes perfect sense that our dreams at night could be little microcosms, little mini lives, possibly. There's a lot more that it could be, but it's some sort of a, a microcosm of the bigger life, which is longer. And then from what I've learned looking into afterlife stuff and near-death experiences and people that managed to maintain contact with loved ones who had died, it seems to me that the next level up is just like just a bigger life than this life in a sense where, you know, where just time is, is more expanded or, or whatever. And this is like one night asleep there in a way. Yeah. I can't say I know what's going on at all. Really. Uh, I think it's also really questionable. Like they haven't really proven like if our pineal gland is or pineal gland or whatever is secreting DMT during sleep. I'm not sure if that's what's happening, but it definitely, when you smoke DMT, it definitely feels like the same sort of like lucid dream type thing. And yeah, I don't know what is actually happening or if it's like somewhere else, um, but I, I definitely feel like I've lived a bunch of different lives. Like every time I wake up from a dream, it just feels like, I don't know, sometimes it carries over, like this this feeling is lingering, but it's like such a intense feeling. Like sometimes I'll meet somebody in the dream and we'll spend like hours together or I'm hanging out with all these people and they feel so real and I'll wake up and there's that lingering feeling that there is there, but, uh, who knows if it's an actual place or if it's literally just coming out of nowhere. Yeah. There's so, there's so many things that could be going on with dreams. Of course, I don't really know what's going on with the larger scope of reality, but f the fact that everything else that we can see in the physical world does have sort of that fractal nature to it does lead me to think there is just like a larger life waiting for us outside of this life. And why we would even have just like why we have dreams this life itself is very possibly a communication from our self to ourself about who we are, about what we want to experience or about what we're afraid of. There could be a lot of reasons for the communication. I've also thought that it seems plausible that if the, our larger self, so to speak, our total self is some kind of an artist and that these lives are works of art. The, in, a, in the form of experiences, it would make sense that you could have more than one project going at once. And maybe sometimes when you're dreaming, you might be changing channels over to a different one that has something to experience that you can't experience in your current life in that direct of a way. And that's even why you're having them at, happen in parallel is so that you can learn from, you, you can accomplish something in one with lessons that you needed from the other, if, if that makes sense. And, you know, all just theory and conjecture, but it's kind of supported by my own experience. And that's all I've got to go on. Yeah, I seeing how all of them are put, simply put, since I'm aware of the lucid dream at night, then I'm also aware of deep sleep without any dreams. And then when I wake up, I'm aware of my waking reality. And then maybe I'm awake and I'm like uh, tripping on some psychedelic. I'm also aware of that. It seems like all these experiences are happening to one 
awareness. Like I'm aware of all these different things. So uh, they're like seamlessly connected. I'm not, sh I wouldn't say they're like uh, disconnected really. Like uh, maybe diff, I guess a metaphor would be beads on a, a string. And the thing that's aware of them, all of the things, like watching them like movies, is like the continuous thing through all the different experiences. Uh, yeah, I think that would be like the best uh, way to describe or summarize, I guess, where they're happening. They're all happening in our consciousness. What's interesting, though, is that we talked about sort of that blank slate, pure self, um, just awareness, you know, but in a way that almost doesn't exist because every experience that we can ever look at, there's something that we're bringing to it. It's not, you know, like the only, only way I can ever go totally to like a blank space or full void is in meditation. And even that I'm still constantly dredging up things on that were coming out of my unconscious for me to look at. So, you know, is is there even you know, ontologically speaking is there even such a thing as nothingness that's one thing that people will bring up in like in like buddhist thought everything is like essentially emptiness or nothingness but i challenge that idea in my thinking because it seems like there's something <laughs> there's always something to be aware of it's never actual yeah. like pure emptiness um well if there is from my experience uh it's not like a dead nothing it's like alive because um there is definitely like that sort of emptiness uh, that you can experience it in dreams or i mean that's what people describe as spiritual experiences they feel on they feel like this openness or whatever or like the, the awareness but yeah, when people think of the idea of nothingness or emptiness, a complete absolute, it, yeah, it seems to have to be like magical or something, not just a dead nothingness. Yeah, it's, it's not really pure nothingness. It's more like stillness on water. It's like all those waters are there, but they're temporarily still. They're no longer churning and raging. I think that's where the real power is for us as beings is to always recognize the stillness in things. And that's an idea I picked up from Walter Russell, but it totally makes sense, makes sense mechanically because the fulcrum of any lever is always a still point. The, there's always some, there's always a middle between any polarities like the inhale and then there's a pause and that represents a middle and then an exhale and a pause and that represents another middle and things are always, it seems moving from moving out from the center and then creating a new middle and moving back another way, if that makes sense. So the stillness is this seems like that's the balancing point. That's the observer in a way is that sort of complete blank stillness, but it's stillness of potential but all the potential still being there makes it not exactly pure nothingness. That's my best way of understanding it. Yeah. And I guess you can't perceive it, the stillness and the nothingness. Exactly. Like you can't. And I guess the only way of knowing that it does exist is being it. You can't like look at yourself in that same way or like, objectively prove it scientifically which is why i think so far our consciousness is like the greatest mystery in science and something that they don't even really talk about in like psychology so much um in textbooks at least which is crazy because the word psychology is actually soul knowledge or soul study because the psyche that word actually means soul and it's just been since freud and not that this is Freud's fault, but it was basically reworked in American psychology to mean studying the just mental processes and like sort of on a physical pharmacological basis and not on looking at the actual soul itself, which is 
the real heart and origin of what psychology is. Yeah. I, when I was in college, um, I remember my first year I took like psychology 101 or like 300 students in that class. And we had this textbook and I was obviously interested in psychology because of all these dreams and stuff. And like, what, like wondering how is it that I'm even like aware right now? How, how is it that somehow all of this is just like happening and I'm like conscious. Well, when I would open up that psychology book, there was one little section on the word consciousness and it was nothing like interesting at all. It was just like basically just sort of almost avoiding talking about it in depth, I guess, because it was so mysterious. So you're definitely not going to find like a lot of discussions about this in a university setting. No, and it's really too bad because that type of forum is great for having this type of discussion, exploration and discovery, you know, because people in the age of going to universities, unless they've been completely locked into their own psychic and physical body armor to keep themselves from being sensitive to the fact that they're curious about this and that they might be even anxious about this and, you know, excited about this and all the above. If we didn't have that sort of, that sort of shell and that distraction of just wanting knowledge for what we can do with it materially, then we might be cultivating thinkers like came out of early German idealism, like Schelling and Hegel and what they like, that's the stuff that I've been getting really into lately because they do ask these questions of, you know, subject and object and, the, the existential, the big existential questions are actually addressed in those early, those are philosophers though. And I think that's kind of, I guess that's what's gotten lost on psychology is that psychology and philosophy ought to be hand in hand. And I think Jung is one of the most interesting recent people that somehow snuck into Western psychology because of maybe dream interpretation being useful as a as a tool. But yeah, um, I'm curious, I guess, like what to ask you more about yourself, what led you from, you know, what were you studying in school and what led you to start working so much on creating comics? Well, first of all, I've been drawing since like maybe I was four years old, maybe even before that. Uh, I think my mom just gave me a pen and pencil. I mean, a pen and paper like when I was sitting in the shopping cart waiting for her to pick up groceries and stuff so I've been drawing ever since like I had an art mentor for two years in elementary school um I just kept doing it all up until now so it's been kind of my number one passion and uh I just knew that that's what I wanted to do I guess for the rest of my life Uh, I was always writing stories too as a little kid so I guess that lasted until now also. Um, but in school, I was like many younger teenagers, kind of just following that wave, I guess, uh, the pressure of society telling you that you had to go to a university, get a degree, you know, blah, 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 blah. A lot of that led to led me into like a very dark state of mind where I felt like now I'm basically just going to chase a bunch of stuff that I don't care about. And I didn't care about money. I know you need it, but I didn't care. I was just being naive and I wasn't really interested in any sort of successful career or whatever. And so That suffering, that depression, I guess, uh, led me into more of a spiritual way of life, I guess. I guess I got really experimental with uh, psychedelics because of that, because I wanted to understand consciousness. And they didn't teach me that in college, so I had to sort of show myself 
I guess. And so a lot of that, these personal stories and my explorations in my own mind is basically the biggest um, theme in my artwork is like self discovery and a lot of trippy things. Uh, I like to do visionary art. Um, I mean, I've seen some crazy things that I'll, a lot of listeners probably have seen similar things, but I mean, walking around most people around, I don't know that they've like met the machine elves, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, I feel like it's really special when you do meet somebody ha that has like similar interests um, because it can be a really deep relationship. But so far, it seems less common to meet anybody interested in just like uh, boring self self realization or whatever. But yeah, anyway, I forgot to mention also that I was studying horticulture in college, but that doesn't really matter. <laughs> oh, it does matter. Actually, that's like one of the biggest solutions to the the current state of the dream we're in right now, <laughs> the collective dream. If people yeah. learned more horticulture, myself included, and put that to good use, we'd need less money because we'd be growing our own food. We'd need less. Oh, yeah, that's exactly my thought. I think I just chose that. It was specifically like um, growing food, like food production, and environmentally friendly, basically is what I learned. I figured I didn't want to go to school for art because, I don't know, the art culture and art school just seems weird to me. So, yeah, I just think I just picked that because it felt like I mean, we might need it or something. That's smart. That's good. You have a good connection to your intuition, clearly. And I think that's why you were put through that sort of suffering and depression experience because of the fact that you stayed open to your to your own self because yourself is the one you know the imperial self is very stubborn and uncompromising and if you're not staying if you're not in touch with it then it slams the door on you back and it doesn't feel good you know if you're be being untrue to it and it doesn't put up with all that much before yeah. the next thing you know you're having sort of like anti-synchronicities in your life and you're almost getting ruled by those ruled by the inner demons, if you will. So it's, it's very cool that e even so young in life, you've gotten to a point where you can be more at peace with these things and now in, enjoy what comes next, which is, you know, the unknown, first of all, which is not a scary thing. It's a positive thing. And secondly, a lifetime of surprising yourself with your own, imagination through the, the fact that you're a creator. Yeah. I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> like I, yeah, like it just kind of spontaneously happens like a dream basically. Uh, but yeah, in the past I used to just always be thinking about the future and, and like the past and always reminiscing and being so nostalgic about what was so good about the past and now it's not here anymore. So I do feel a lot better that I don't focus on the mind stuff so much anymore. And I hopefully can like keep um, putting that into my artwork, I guess, for people to uh, enjoy. I'm not sure if somehow it must end up in the things I make a little bit. Oh, definitely. Even from even the abstract stuff, but I really just, you know, this is the, the, the time where I really wish I could show people listening to audio pictures right now. But there's this one comic you have where it's uh, like this cool little alien being and he asks you, the reader, to just do a little experiment with him, which is kind of like what we described earlier, where you just delete and forget all those social identity things. And to get back to the imperial self, which is just that pure awareness part of yourself. But I don't think it, part of it's not just the awareness, but it's also sort of the inner 
emotional, physical reaction that we have to things that we experience, that we observe, that when we are paying attention to how we feel, that's also the imperial self. And I think what we get in psychology with the division between id, ego, and superego, a lot of times in psychology, it seems to be portrayed like the ego is the one that's out of whack or that's the bad one. And the id is the scary one where all the demons live. But really the id is like that deep self that contains everything the in potential that you have ever had or ever known. And the ego is that physical body self where your, your skin is the exterior of that ego, which is the character that you are in this dream. And the superego to me actually seems like the one that's to blame for a lot of the strife that we're feeling because that's the part of us that is informed by the midvelt or the, the world of other people is for, you know, we're a Trinity. We have our own inner world. We have the outside cosmos itself in totality. And then we have the world of other people, the social world. And it's always those expectations that we're putting on ourselves from what we think others want of us or trying to please other people that are not pleasable. You know, all of these things that are relationships with the super ego or other people that are causing our biggest self-destructive tendencies and negative feelings about ourselves particularly. Yeah. And I think once you do um, first, like you talk, we were talking about the alien comic I did where he basically, yeah, just tells you to forget about the future, the past what's here right now, basically like without and making any effort or even thinking about any of our knowledge that we've learned about psychology or theories, um, you basically is just the message of that comic. I was just trying to, I guess, bring to attention what is actually most effortless. That's just, uh, no matter how hard you try, it's still going to be here. Even if you don't make a single effort or if you try so hard to try to concentrate and meditate and whatever, or try to understand what is the superego or the id and uh, the, the other ego or however many egos or whatever, this person's ego and my ego and blah, 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 blah. All of these things, I guess, just to bring it back to the awareness, all of them are happening in front of you, right? Yeah, it's it's all. I like the maxim "all is self" because what like whether it's in the dream or it's in the quote unquote waking world, what it is that you're experiencing is a reflection of what's inside you at all times. And I think there's a, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't require any specialized knowledge to be able to work with that reflection and mirror and, you know, let evolution take its course as it wants to in your consciousness and in your body. It, it's, you know, mostly it is about a very simple how you feel about something, you know, how you feel about what's in front of you when it comes to relationships with other people or behavior patterns or places you go, things that make you feel good, make you feel energized, make you feel stoked are what your body or your, like your holy guardian angel, your imperial self, imperial self is trying to tell you to go towards and not like in a hedonistic way, because you know if you do something hedonistically pleasurable, like you get blacked out drunk, it's actually – if you're paying attention, if you're really present, it's not that fun, first of all. And then second of all, there's this visceral negative reaction in the body. So there's your, there's your answers. There's your guidance system. There's all the, the God or you know, the spirituality you need is right there in what makes you feel good, what makes you feel bad in your body, in your health. So, uh, Ethan, tell us where to watch out for new things from you. Do you have anything in the works that you're excited about or 
uh, want to share or are you keeping that close to the chest right now? Well, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Art of Ethan. Also, you can get my comic book at, I think, magicvoid.bigcartel.com. I also have a Patreon, uh, it's Art of Ethan, where I am currently making an ongoing comic called The Ancient Mystery that goes into a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today uh, with a lot of like um, futuristic stuff like cyberpunk, I guess. And uh, I guess it's just about like dreams and psychedelic sort of stuff and I guess the journey of self-discovery. So, yeah, I'm just working on that right now. I'm actually going to make a page that will be coming out the day after this recording. So I want to do that. I also have commissions I got to work on. I'm kind of slacking. But as far as things in the future, I just want to make uh, more stories. Um, Hopefully they'll be interesting uh, and help people become more curious and like a lot of the stuff we just talked about. Have you ever checked out the work of Ron Rigi Jr.? Yeah, I've actually met him in person. Uh, oh, that's at cool. the Chicago Alternative Comics Expo. Uh, he was there last year, and um, he was doing some workshop. And so I, I did one of his drawing workshops, and then I got to talk to him. Uh, got a couple of his comics. But yeah, he makes a lot of similar sort of spiritual cartoony stuff. Yeah. I was immediately reminded of him by your work, not at all in like a, you know, copying way, but it just in the, in the fact that it was such, such well done spiritual cartooning. I don't know. It was like, I love both of you guys and I think it's cool that you met him. Um, I've thought about sending him a message to have him on the show sometime because I'm a huge fan of the medium of comics. And that's something I probably should have gotten around to asking you more about. But now is not a bad time. Like, tell me more about what comics you like, uh, you know, your history with that as a medium, what you think about the medium itself. Uh, I like a lot of comics. I mean, I just grew up reading I loved picture books as a little kid, and then I always liked Spider-Man comics <laughs> growing up. Uh, not so much a lot of the other superheroes, but... I've got a Spider-Man tattoo, so I understand. Oh, I love Spider-Man. Um, <laughs> especially the villains. Like, I've got a, a Venom action figure over here. Uh, yeah, so I like a lot of mostly right now, like, alternative... Uh, comics i guess people call them which aren't so much like superhero marvel dc stuff just like i guess what i'm writing is just everyday stuff or weird psychedelic or uh, surreal stories i suppose i guess what's cool about them is somebody i just saw somebody recently said it was like a low budget movie like making comics if you can draw anything really you can just uh, create something that to a reader will feel like somebody on the page exists. And that's why I like uh, using it as a way to um, talk about more of these like metaphysical subjects is that, yeah, like you were saying earlier, it's not coming from me. It's like when the person reads it on the page, it's coming from that character. Like they almost feel like they're a real uh, little creature um, in a world somewhere. Um, so yeah, I like comics for that. Um, I think books, just words, um, let you imagine a lot more stuff. It's a lot more intimate in your mind, but I personally just love drawing and I guess that's why I'm doing comic. Yeah. To, I think there's a lot to be said about the medium as a form of expression that is actually higher in some ways than, okay, there I am with highers and lowers, but it's, it has qualities that the (laughs) written word doesn't have, particularly that you have these sort of waypoints in the form of frames that anchor people to the same story. But then between the frames, you, what you're getting is 
the creation of action and motion in the mind of the person. So they're, yeah. ima- they're magically manifesting that motion between uh, picture to picture in their own way. And they're seeing it in their own way. And it's kind of unique to them. And it's just as similar with books that, you know, they're imagining the picture in their own mind, in their own way. But what's cool is that with a, a drawing, even a simple drawing, you can say thousands of words right there. And so as a form of expression, to me, it makes total sense that the advanced ancient Egyptians were using pictograph hieroglyphics. And I think we're actually becoming more of an image based instead of a word based civilization. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's even a good thing because it's allowing us to be more clear with what we mean and connect emotion uh, more directly to what we're trying to express because with words, we actually stand to be completely compromised by having different interpretations of the same word or not knowing what a word means and all kinds of things. But anyone, you draw a picture of a human face, everyone knows what that is. There's no questions about it. Yeah, I've always been more visually inclined. So pictures are a lot more exciting for me than just reading information. Um, it is instant too. Like you don't have to like sit there and like take time really. I mean, you can look at all the details and like gradually form a, a like a story out of what you're seeing, but it is like, I don't know, this condensed vibration into like, uh, I don't know, like highly organized molecules that are somehow making the other person's brain do something, which is crazy. And that's another thing I love about, I just like making things I can share with people, I suppose, like that's like the biggest part of it. I mean, when I was a kid growing up and even still, I still like enjoy drawing for myself, but half the fun is like just seeing what people uh, do with it, I guess, or how they consume it or what they think of it, even if it's bad. Um, Just interesting. (laughs) I don't even really have a goal really in what I'm writing. It's just to make a story. And if I made something cool, I think that's really good and pure and it shows in the quality of the stuff you're making, man, that you are just sort of trying to let get yourself out of the way and let the imagination do its thing. I appreciate that greatly and looking forward to being aware of your work going forward. Cause you're, you know, you're a young guy and there's so much, infinite potential for the, the things that you can make in this lifetime. Pretty excited to uh, get you back sometime soon and talk more. We could talk all day, I'm sure, about stuff that we like about comics. That would be fun. I kind of stayed heavy hitting on the metaphysical speculation this episode, which I'm often at fault for doing. <laughs> but I no, think, I think uh, a lot of it was my fault too. Sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, not at all, dude. Uh, uh, I, you know, I'm the host. I steer the ship. You're just, you're just uh, being yourself here, and oh, yeah. I think that's we could go so deep for so long about that stuff is because you have your own history of contemplation and self reflection, and I, I think listeners will appreciate your humble attitude towards what it is that we're talking about and the you know, the genuineness of, of you. And you don't seem, you know, you seem like a very low rent ego type of guy. (laughs) Like, you don't seem needy. You don't seem like, Hey, Hey, give me attention. And that could be sometimes the downfall of an artist being able to get their art to a lot of people is not, you know, I don't care where this goes or what this does. So, but I, I think the universe takes care of that if you bring the imagination to it. So I'll try to play my part as the universe and spread your comics <laughs> with this episode and well, tell people you. about it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's another problem. One of the problem is, I guess, uh, um, sort of a, a little bit of a, an apathy, but also I have to like make money and stuff, you know. But uh, I guess that's part of the human life. I guess is uh, 
trying to figure out how to connect creativity with staying alive, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> we'll, Indeed. We'll, we'll see how that works out, but I definitely trust something. I don't know. If I like don't ever even make one single uh, uh, month rent, just drawing a picture or something, well, I'm okay with that too. I think that's the right attitude to have, man. And you give great advice just by saying how you feel. It it's going to I, like what your the energy and the intent, attention that you're putting into your creations. That itself is a beacon to other people. So unless you just became some sort of completely misanthropic shut in, you'll be fine. What I learned from uh, my my guests on the show who have gotten larger followings is that it's all about increasing the number of potentially serendipitous connections that you've got with other people. And that could come through online or through just getting out there. And it sounds like you do get out there. You know, you went to Alternative Comics Expo. Um, I expect nothing but uh, good things for you, man. Your heart's in the right place. And do you have anything else you want to say before we close out for now and uh, say goodbye to the peeps? I would just say to anybody who's creative or an artist like me or is still even trying to figure out what the heck their life is about, to just trust that feeling or that pull or whatever that feels, um, I guess, just trust in the universe. I don't know what other advice you would need other than that. But uh, yeah, just check me out where I said on Instagram, Art of Ethan, Twitter, all that. If you want to talk or something, message me. I don't know. You can be my friend. <laughs> cool, man. I'm glad that we're friends now, too. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah. And thanks, everyone, for listening. There it is, Ethan Nichols, another fantastic guest, another person who I took their podcasting virginity, yet they were unbelievably deep, and I really liked Ethan's constant commitment to the fact that no matter what it is that you're talking about or whatever thing you're describing or experience, talking about any experience, it's always something there watching, and that's what you are. You're the thing that's watching. It's really important to know. It can be something that leads us into sort of disassociating from reality a little bit once we make this connection to the eternal observer within. But it also is empowering and makes you realize the freedom that you actually have in this life. That no matter what's happening to you, you're still the same thing <laughs> at your core. So you're actually always safe in that way. And everything's fine. So if you like the episode and you want to check out Interverse Plus, see what that extension was like. I'll give you a little bit of a taste. We talked about learning to let others come to the truth in their own time, which is tricky for me. I love to talk to people about stuff they might not be ready to talk about. <laughs> we talked about the eternal source of consciousness and discussions about DMT beings, what they might be, the magic of photons and the timeless quality of light speed. We talked about the meaning of meaning and what's true beyond the filter of our perceptions. We talked about the possible connection between UFO beings and ancestor spirits and those DMT beings from earlier. And we talked about reaching the spiritual maturity to always recognize the inner peace within, which is kind of what I was talking about, realizing it's always okay. So of course there was plenty more than that, but I can't you know, tell you all of it. If you're curious, hop on patreon.com forward slash interverse subscribe to plus you can find a link in the show notes or from my website i hope that the concepts that i threw around in the episode were not too off the wall or out of the blue i've been very fascinated by the entire concept of psychology and reality for my whole life of course and i've also become quite suspicious of a lot of what people are i guess espousing about consciousness about the universe because when I look at the problems that we have in the world, it's always coming back to that malignant dogma of culture that tells people this is the way things are and this way they have to be. And 
one of the things that is common in a lot of both new age type of stuff and religious stuff, both, is the idea that to connect with God or to somehow have cosmic universal consciousness or whatever it is that they're talking about in whatever school of thought it is, it's always kill the ego, destroy the ego, and that's how you get free. And I don't know about that because the more I study psychology, and then the more I just think about the concept on my own too, I'm thinking the ego is not really quite as illusory as we make it out to be. And maybe it's actually our physical bodies here have some kind of connection to our ego more directly than people want to say. Because yes, I can agree that the source of consciousness can, is non-local in a sense, but that's because it's more like it's non-physical. But I still think it's maybe a spark that's inside of your body, at least while you're living in it. And even when you leave your body, there's like an astral body that you've got, supposedly, and that could still contain the spark and it could be driving around. And it's not that it's, I'm not trying to reduce who we are to some sort of physical thing or whatever, or even a, a material object or, you know, put it in a box and confine it and define it. I'm thinking more like the spark that I'm talking about is a sort of singularity, an infinite density, infinite amount of information in an infinitely small, basically non-existent point. And this is just wild conjecture, but why I'm going into this and bringing up the ego is because if that thing lives inside of our bodies for the times that we're in our bodies and our bodies are actually powered by it and growing out of it, then our bodies are kind of like an extension of it in a really real way. And if you hurt a tree by chopping off the top branches or something, it probably still, like the tree, the core, the, what the tree is, the being, is suffering. So anyway, everything that's extending out of that spark, I feel like is actually you, even though if you reduced everything down and you know, you're talking about the grand scheme of eternity, the body you're in and the personality you've got aren't the permanent you, but it is who you are right now. And since we are here experiencing this weird movie called life, it just seems like one of the things the new age has got right is that it's all about love. And if we're constantly like, kill our ego, kill the ego, I'm thinking that's not super loving. And that's coming from society mostly, from other people. Is it really your natural inclination that you want to destroy the personality that you currently have and not be the you that you are? Because I'm pretty sure all of us naturally fight that a lot. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't deal with our ego's negative tendencies or our bad habits or whatever, but why I'm connecting the ego to the body is because that's all connected to our bodies, that type of stuff, like our bad thoughts, bad behaviors, pain, all kinds of stuff. It's locked in the physical body and being kind of against the body or over too far on the spiritual side, not taking care of your body, whether it's not eating right or not getting enough exercise, and we all have our own struggles with this for sure. That's Those are the things that keep us from actually healing the problems with our ego, <laughs> is the physical discomfort, disease, bad health, whatever. So, you know, this is all just what I think. I hope no one takes me as like some sort of prescriptor of absolute truth, but I think if you guys think about this with me, some of you might agree that, yeah, maybe I don't want to kill my ego. Maybe I want to get free from the super ego, which is the little voice in your head that's telling you what other people think about you. That's a way more dangerous thing, I think, than your, you know, your ego personality is that sort of that's the fake thing. That's the voice that's telling you someone's looking at you that's not even looking at you. And it's unconsciously running all the time and telling you like you're stupid or wow you really fucked that up or whatever you know that voice in your head that's mean to yourself <laughs> i don't think that's the ego anyway just just trying to get an anatomy of our consciousness here <laughs> i recognize the total oneness of all being and all that but while we're in these bodies there is some anatomy to be discovered both in the physical and in the mental so you know, talking about things as higher and lower really does seem like a religious trap as well. And so that's why I really don't want to put the body higher than the mind or the spirit. 
or lower. I just think that these things are all in a balance. They're a trinity and they're more like something that's coming from a, out from a core and to a surface. And like the ego is the surface and the core is your spirit. And then it's not really, in that metaphor, it's not really higher or lower anymore. You know, it's a different shape. <laughs> anyway, I think the higher self is actually your body. I think the thing that inspires you to do what's good for you, that is your spirit, but it's also coming through your body. It's coming through what your genes are telling you in a way. Like, it doesn't it feel good to go, like, run around and play outside, stuff like that? <laughs> That's your... That's your body and your spirit working together. And anyway, you you chose this body because you wanted to come here from the greater infinite part of yourself, which means you want to experience this life for some reason. So it is important to develop the true self and a healthy ego and not destroy the ego completely since you are meant to learn from it. At least it seems that way. Of course, you can choose whatever meaning for your life you want, but most likely we all did choose this experience on some level like before we got here. Anyway, this conversation wound up being way more about things other than comics than I thought. I would have liked to talk more about comics. It's actually one of my favorite things. And so after I have Ethan back, I'm going to maybe look into getting a few other cool comic artists on in the future. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. And like I said, remember that you can check out the full episode on patreon.com forward slash interverse. Also, you can check out Ethan's Instagram, Art of Ethan really good stuff also worth supporting him on patreon i'm a patron of his and i love getting the early update pages from his new work the ancient mystery so i guess that's all for me guys and oh you know what while i'm here why don't i tell you why the show hasn't been out for a while why there's only been one episode in july so far i do thank you for your patience about that i hopefully at least a few of you were on the edge of your seat like when's the next interverse well <laughs> I had a couple of deaths in my family and they just really, I mean, apart from taking up a lot of time, just, you know, going and being with people and dealing with all that. I'm not saying this in a complaining way. That just takes up a lot of time. And I wanted to give that time, you know? And also there were some times when maybe I did have an opportunity to work on this, but I just wasn't quite in the mood. And it's not that I was super sad or morose. It was more like, I just wanted to give some space to the show while I was dealing with that, you know, trying to be the best version of myself through those uh, experiences that I could. So thanks for being patient about that. I will definitely continue to try to get three or four episodes out in a month. And next episode's already recorded. It will be coming out as fast as I can get it done off the heels of this one. And I actually spoke to a professional psychic and astrologer. That's going to be a really cool episode. I learned a lot about my own personal chart through sidereal astrology, which we'll explain in that episode. But for now, thanks for listening. That's it for me. Stay tuned for the next episode with astrologer lady Desiree. And uh, <laughs> thank you again for being here in this human experience with me. Don't forget, I guess, before I leave, I'll tell you also, if you... Get on the iTunes podcast app and subscribe through there. You can also leave a five-star review. Super helpful. And forgot to announce, Spotify is now carrying Interverse podcasts. So if you like to use Spotify, that's a great way to listen to the show. I bet. I don't use it, but I bet. It's great. I'm glad it's on there. Uh, so yeah, subscribe in those places. Leave me thumbs up and five stars and like my stuff so that my, pre my poor, you know, fragile psyche can continue doing this work and be fueled by all your attention and praise. <laughs> but I do like to be told that I'm doing something good or bad. I just like to be, you know, talked to. I'm like you guys. Please hit me up online, social media, Interverse Podcast. I'd love to hear from you. You guys are beautiful. Thanks for listening. And may you always remember that you're actually everything and nothing and there's nothing to be afraid of or something like that. All right, bye.